Hi, my name is Stuart Sampson, and I'm going to be running through some of the new uh, and updated uh, V2022 functionalities that are coming out under the, the concept and optimization umbrella. And there's really three main things that I'm going to be covering today. So uh, the skeletal modeling um, capability. So this has been a project that's been going on for uh, just over a year or so, um, and is really geared towards being able to create a reduced order model from a detailed input. And I'll go into a lot more detail, obviously, as, uh, as we go through these slides. Uh, the second point here is the geometry reconstruction. So how do you go from an optimized uh, reduced order model back to a high fidelity model? Um, some of this functionality was actually released um, in earlier versions, but I think it's worth noting that under the concept of an opt optimization uh, theme is that this is a really key enabler to, um, to, to, to really complete the, the workflow. Then the last thing on the right hand side is the polycage support. So we're now able to take in um, the polycages and obviously the polynerbs, which we have traditionally been able to read already uh, from Inspire into uh, the Hyperworks. And I'll, I'll talk through some of the use cases for uh, for that support too. OK, I just wanted to back up uh, just for a couple of minutes and just give you a, a very quick overview for what has already been released for the uh, concept of optimization. Um, uh, projects. So on the bottom left hand side, we've released the design space for global, local and adhesive. Uh, we're seeing a lot of success uh, at a variety of customers for being able to generate their design space models and run topology optimization. Uh, we released Sketcher in um, uh, released probably six months ago now, and obviously that will be available in version 2022 as well. Uh, it's also based in 2021.2 uh, as well. And I can't stress enough about how powerful this is especially for concept um, and also for creating the sections, being able to kind of regenerate uh, geometry um, from, fr from your models. Uh, the section library was added. Um, that can be overridden. So actually any customer can kind of uh, upload their own sections to, uh, to this library. There is the rapid part creation capability, leveraging the, the sketcher that is now available. We added uh, bulkhead and doubler workflows such that you don't need to go back to CAD to generate these parts if you're doing initial concept studies. Um, so you have a certain KPI metric that you need to meet. Uh, you can add these to, to improve the stiffness, for example. And then the last point, I'm going to show a quick demo of this, the geometry reconstruction. OK, so in version 2022, there are two main things that we're going to be adding for concept and optimization. That's the skeleton modeling. And then the interpretation of the um, well, interpretation using polycage and polynabs. OK, so just uh, focusing on the main topic today, and that's really the, uh, the skeletal modeling. So we are actively working on uh, absorbing what makes sense from the C123 tools into core and uh, design space being one of those things. But really, skeletal modeling is kind of the first major initiative um, to take what uh, the C123 tools uh, have enabled and, and bring at least the model build portion into uh, core Hyperworks. Now, this is actually covered for more than just automotive. Uh, oil and gas, we're seeing use cases, and it could also be leveraged for AEC as well. But if we just focus on the automotive uh, use cases, there are a number of different inputs that can be taken. So traditionally and normally, it would be high fidelity input, like a donor FE model, or it could be CAD geometry. But there are other use cases, so these tools or skeleton modeling can also be used for topology interpretation as well. So really taking any of those inputs and deriving a 1D, 2D hybrid, simplified, reduced order model from, from those inputs. And certainly going from CAD directly to the 1D, 2D model would be a, a huge time saver. So it prevents you from having to mid-mesh um, and then reconstruct the model with many, many manual steps in between. OK, so just from a high level overview, so if the original source is a high fidelity model, which this is the case here, uh, this could be a topology result. But for this example, we've just gone with uh, the high fidelity uh, FEM model. The first step would be to organize and identify the, the joints. OK, now these joints are currently created as a 1D representation. These joints over time could be swapped out for super elements or any other uh, representation that may be appropriate for the level of detail that you'll be looking at for this uh, reduced order model. So we have all the infrastructure in place to, uh, to support this. The next step is then to identify the members. So you've got the B pillar, the A pillar, etc. So this is where obviously um, the, the members will be running through and obviously at the front and the rear of the vehicle, it gets a lot more complicated. 
Um, but we have all the tools there to ge generate the, uh, the reduced oil model here. And then the last main step is the panel support. So things like the windshield, the roof panels, the floor, um, and the rear quarter is typically uh, a complicated area to model and that we have also the uh, tools to, to generate not only a new panel, but also uh, you can take an existing panel uh, within the skeletal modeling workflow and use that and connect it to the, um, uh, the skeletal model that you're, you're creating. And ultimately, you'll end up with an output that is not too dissimilar to this. Uh, this is probably a little bit more detailed than, than typical maybe, but uh, this is the, uh, the typical representation of a 1D, 2D hybrid skeleton model. Now for each of those skeleton members, those members could be a detailed wheel section or a box section, depending on the optimization you're doing and the level of detail that you're interested in. And again, we support both, uh, both those workflows. And here's just a schematic from start to finish, showing how we actually have the tools now to go uh, from the start to finish. But also, um, you'll see in the, the demos as well that this is actually relatively streamlined now, and that um, with minimal user interpretation and feedback or input, I should say, we're able to generate these models. As we get into a little bit more detail now, we are also able to support the multiple variants as well. So on the right hand side, you can see that we've actually added a new browser, the skeleton browser. It's, it can be a single pane kind of repository on the uh, right hand side here. So clicking on this icon here, we then open it up into a dual pane where you can actually model the variance. So what we actually have here is we have a sedan model listed here. It's a hierarchical definition of the skeleton model. And then we also have a wagon variant down here. Now, the members and joints and panels represented by the yellow, uh, the red and the green here. There's obviously commonality between the sedan and wagon. Any of the additional points highlighted in blue, you can see that are highlighted listed down here. So the members and joints are unique to the wagon variant. Everything else is common across both the sedan and the, the wagon. So all of that can be saved within the .hm file um, and that these joints and members and panels can be reused for, for multiple variants. So you make a change once and it is then applied to all uh, variants. Okay, so just going into a little bit more detail now as to how this works. Um, I'm not going to go into as much detail within the demo itself, but within the joint creation and editing, ultimately you start off with a detailed model, or it could be topology, either way, and you end up getting a uh, 1D representation with the beam sections, the, the mesh, the 1D mesh, and uh, yeah, the beam sections applied with either real or, or box sections. If I just zoom in slightly here, I'm just going to run through a few of the options here. Typically, you're going to be picking a point or a node on the outside. It's going to create a bounding box. That bounding box is fully configured. You'll be able to pick the element type and whether it's a real or box section. And just these are some of the options I want to make sure uh, that I get time to, to run through just now. So the bounding box can be altered in size in any dimension. You can move that bounding box in obviously any and all uh, directions to make sure that the element input is uh, as appropriate or accurate as possible. You're able to click on a face of that bounding box and manipulate that interactively. And you can also exclude certain components. So you can see part of this roof rail here, I've excluded that from the selection. Now, based off that element selection, we will then derive the centroid for the joint. So what you can't actually see here, actually, this is probably a better representation. That centroid there is calculated based off the elements that you have selected. So that is the reason why we give you all of the flexibility and freedom to really derive the, um, the, the, the most appropriate, accurate input. And at the same time, when this joint um, is created, we'll create the 1D mesh and apply the, the beam sections all in one go. All of this is fully editable as well, which I'll show you in just uh, the next slide. So this is just a slide here highlighting that based off that selection up here, you can pick real or box section, again, depending on the level of detail that you're interested in. At any point in time, you can always pick a joint and then apply the beam section to it. So no matter what we create by default as the output, you can override that with any user configured beam section you might already have whether that's being created um, on the fly or from a, from a library. You can also edit the joint as well. 
So our automatic input will be close to probably what you want, but it may not be perfect. And that is why we add the ability to add and remove legs. So this is important, especially when you've got a very organic structure like a uh, topology result. You may at a joint, for example, want four, um, well, typically you're gonna want four legs, but you may want three legs. Uh, and if you need to add one, then you can. So here, just by selecting the joint, you can click the plus and then you can add an additional leg. And this is just an example where we've got a leg kind of going vertically here. By default, we create the leg at the intersection where that bounding box cuts through the actual um, topology, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, de definition of the, the model itself. And we'll place the centroid of that leg at that, uh, that true intersection. There's a lot of calculation that goes on, not just for the, um, the joint centroid, but also the centroid of the, um, the, the leg here. Now, if you want to override that, you can just by again, clicking the joint, click the leg, and then there is a, um, an option here to actually move that in the vertical uh, or hor horizontal direction. So you can see here, I'll just move the, uh, the leg. So again, you've got a lot of accurate con control for uh, the placement of these things. So this next one here is the joint alignment. So you notice here now, I've, I've literally just been talking about joints uh, for the last five minutes or so. Uh, I haven't even started talking about the members or panels yet, but so there's a lot of detail within this workflow that I think we've simplified significantly to get you to the point where you can start building out these models much more efficiently. So with the alignment, this is obviously important within an automotive structure and any structure where there's uh, symmetry, but there may be cases where you need to manually align those joints. So there is the option now to pick joints and then able to uh, to align them, as you can see here. And we're actually snapping this node, sorry, this joint to the corresponding joint. So you pick a parent and then the child will basically snap to the alignment. Now there's different ways this could be handled. You could have modeled this in symmetry and then you wouldn't have had this problem in the first place, but we needed to um, have this option, especially when you're modeling these joints in 3D space. Uh, inevitably, uh, you will need to do some alignment. So speaking of symmetry, uh, we can take the model and basically run through and create these entities in, in symmetry. Um, you can create a custom symmetry plane or by default, we do the projections based off the global design space and we're able to create the symmetry plane based off that. And there is an option to basically um, automatically uh, create the corresponding joints and members in uh, a symmetry uh, context. So here I've gone through and I've picked the symmetry. I've executed the, uh, the, the function here and you can see that both these members and joints are reflected uh, in symmetric form based off that symmetry plane here. So this is extremely important for when you're optimizing and you're wanting to link design variables uh, together. You have the option of creating unique properties or you can link the properties together. You can also create members by symmetry. So rather than just creating a member from joint A to joint B all in one go, which is perfectly fine, you could elect if you wanted this member to be in symmetry to actually create it that, that way as well. So by, by default, we would project halfway through we would give you the preview of the sections, and then when you execute, obviously that, um, that the second side here would be symmetric. So again, this is important for, for optimization further downstream, where you want to link these, uh, these section profiles together to make sure everything is uniform. Okay, so just moving on to uh, the next portion about members. There are a lot of controls for member creation. So typically, not typically, a member will always be created between two joints. Now, by default, when you click the two joints, we'll give you a preview, and that preview will show you the cut plane, uh, which is fully controlled. By default, we set to three, but you could update, you could change that to any uh, any number you want. You're able to move in three uh, dimensions this cut plane, and it is in real time, it will show you the feedback as to where that cut plane is going to be. So if you capture a hole, or there is a notch that is caught, uh, or you've got a part drop off or a part addition that you do or don't want, then you can very accurately move this to where the section is going to be created. Also, these um, uh, hard points or control points, I should say, along this member are calculated in real time too. So if I go and reduce the sketch plane, sorry, the section plane size, these control points are dynamically updated as well. So based off the, um, uh, the section, we create the centroid that is, uh, that is accurate based off the, um, uh, the, the cut plane. 
So here you can just see an example of me moving the actual section. And I'll, I'll show you this in uh, in the demo as well. I just want to make sure I cover all the options. Here I've reduced the cut plane. You can see how it's trimmed the actual profile itself. And you can see that control point now has moved in the vertical direction. So you now see that this member is no longer straight because um, it's derived based off the, uh, the the red preview there. Once you're happy with that, you can then execute and then that will go through and create the member, create the 1D mesh and apply the beam sections all in one hit. OK, so once you've created the uh, the joints and all of the members, whether you're using symmetry or not, you can then go through and create the panels. There are two options to create panels. There is the basic automatic mode, whereby we will do an interpolation based off the uh, four members and create a best fit panel. There is also the option to take an existing panel or, or part, sorry, within the um, model itself, like a body side, something that's complicated that we can't auto generate and use that as a panel as well. Those panels can then be connected and you can see this in the top right hand image here with the appropriate 1D element representations connecting the panel to the actual um, uh, 1D skeleton members and joints. Using the automatic mode, there is also an option to do an offset. So you can see how this panel is kind of uh, offset and shrunk. It's not flush with the, the members and joints, as you see down here. So there's also that option, too. And there is also a separate context for connections. So you can connect uh, panels to members, uh, member to member, and then panel to panel, depending on what you're doing. OK, so just moving on to some of the probably more non-automotive use cases, we can actually take uh, any line or 1D data and reverse engineer that to create uh, um, uh, joints and members. So here's just a, an offshore platform. Uh, this was actually just line data, but you can see very quickly we can do the absorb and uh, create the lines and joints. It's then very easy to make design changes. Um, and you can apply your beam sections uh, and your mesh uh, easily as well. So there are some more advanced options in that if there is a lot of um, um, uh, redundancy within the model. We're able to equivalence things, combine and, and remove a lot of the noise. So here, what we're actually doing is we're actually equivalencing uh, where you've got a number of joints. There's two joints actually overlaying and we're actually equivalencing those. And you can see they've gone from four, uh, sorry, six down to the four joints. The number of members stays the same. So this is really just removing and equivalencing the number of joints. There are other options in that you can actually based off a tolerance also do the equivalence whereby we have to start off with three joints and we reduce it down to one in this case and then there is also another option to allow the member um, destruction so if there are legs here based off that, um, that joint if that option is enabled we can actually destroy those uh, legs and then go from basically three three joints down to, to one so it really depends on the use case um, and again, the level of detail uh, that you want to, to model within, uh, within within your model. We also have the ability to combine. So if you want to combine uh, all the joints and members into one, then you are able to do that. So you can see here we've gone from four joints on the left hand side down to two on the right and then three members down to, to one. Basically a simplification. And then if there are two uh, members overlapping, we have the ability to detect and remove one of those. And I think now is probably a good time that I jump out of this and just jump straight to the demo. So this. OK, so what I'm going to do now is just demo the um, the new skeleton workflow that is now available uh, in version 2022 and clicking on the, the ribbon bar up here at the very top. You can see that we're now uh, entering into the, um, uh, the skeleton uh, environment. The icon on the top left, this will actually invoke the skeleton browser itself. And that is actually configured in two forms. So we have a split pane form for doing the variant management that I mentioned earlier on in the, uh, the presentation, and also a single pane form, which is really just the, um, uh, the entities created within the session itself. And that if you're not using variants or creating variants, then typically you, you probably wouldn't need to use the, the split pane. So as you go through and you create your model, you'll start to see these entities being populated. Now, what I've got here is a full uh, vehicle body and white. And for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to go to a smaller 
uh, representation of that same file and just look at the cutout of the roof itself. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in slightly. There we go. And I'm going to basically start from uh, the left-hand side and work my way through to the right-hand side and walk you through this, uh, this entire process. So you're going to start off by creating joints and automatically, as soon as you click on uh, the entity here, as soon as you click on the, um, uh, the, the workflow, the context, as soon as you hover over any part of the model, we give you the preview of the bounding box. And it's asking for a node input. So basically, just select a point. And you can see now that we actually have a bounding box. And that bounding box has encapsulated and captured all of the FE uh, mesh within it. Now, this is important because the, uh, the joint location is going to be dictated by the centroid of those elements. So we're actually doing a calculation there. And then obviously the centroid of the leg will also be at the centroid of that section that has been intersected along that face of the uh, the box. We have a lot of options here, whether you want real section, box section, you can pick your element configuration, the mesh size and, and everything else. I'm just going to move this over here. And we also have a lot of control as to where you place this box. So I can move this interactively in 3D, 3D space. Okay. I'm just going to back out there. If I click on this next icon over here, I can then define the bounding box dimensions. So by default, it's 300 by 300 by 300. You can change that. Alternatively, if I click on one of those faces, I can then just independently move one of those faces. And then once you're happy with that, you can then just go and execute the, uh, the creation of the join. Now, you can also click exclude. And uh, so if there's overspill areas or parts that are uh, uh, being captured within the bounding box, you can exclude those if you want. So they're not part of the, uh, the joint creation process. Um, and all of this process works off displayed. Okay, so you can just go through and turn off parts that are not playing a role in the model build portion of this, uh, this workflow. Okay, so I'm happy with that. And I'm going to go through and click create. So you can see now that that has actually created a 1D mesh and applied the beam sections directly to each of those four, uh, four um, legs. All right, so I'm just going to go through and create the next uh, joint here, and I'm just going to accept. But you can see that it's actually captured a hole here. Now, typically, uh, you would want to move that section further out, so I'd increase the box size. Um, or, alternatively, you could exclude that part if you don't want that part of the calculation, or you could then edit the beam section and fill in that hole to make it uh, an enclosed section. But for the uh, for the purpose of this demo and in the interest of time, I'll just accept that. Okay, so now I have two joints, and you can see they are both listed here. And within the entity editor, we have the full definition all the way down to the number of legs and the XY Z locations for the um, oops, the uh, the leg points. There we go. So now I can see the uh, the member sections and the um, all, all of the dimensions. Now eventually, over time, we're going to be able to swap these representations out. And let's say one of these joints could be a super element, um, or it could be a detailed two D representation, um, or it could be a one D representation, like you see on the screen right now. And you'll be able to kind of hot swap these things. Um, to, to the appropriate representation, depending on the level of detail uh, for your reduced order model. Okay, so once you've created the, um, the joints, I could go edit those joints by moving, and I could add legs, delete legs, and I'll talk about that later on. But I'm going to go to uh, Members, and by default we have three control points, so basically the number of sections through. And the cut planes are 300 by 300. So when I click on joint A and joint B, you can see that we have the three cut planes. And if I just zoom in more, you can see that I've got a part addition here. It's captured the notch around here, which you may or, not, may or may not want. But if we just focus on this section here, now if I drag, you can see and I've moved this and it's now captured a hole. Now typically you're not going to want to do that. So, um, you would actively move that to an area where, obviously, you don't capture that hole. It just saves a lot of cleanup further down down the line. And another thing that is really important is that these sections, these profiles, they can be 
not only moved in three dimensions, but they can also be reduced in size. Now you can see that as soon as I make a dimensional change here, interactively, that centroid is dynamically updating. Okay, so you can see that that center point, that control point, is is automatically updating. Oops, accidentally clicked on the uh, the wrong one there. So I'm just going to grow this back out, and you can see the red preview gives you exactly the real time input as to how that section is going to be created. So long story short, all of this is completely live. Um, if you are going to use this mode, it's kind of important that you actually pick accurately to make sure you get an appropriate representation. Now, you can override this mode and just say, right, I just want to go from joint A to joint B. Don't interpolate those sections for me and create them. I'll do that manually as a post step. Um, you absolutely can do that, and there's options to disable some of this advanced functionality. Again, you've got options for reel and box section and, and the mesh size and everything else. So once I'm happy with that, I'll just click on Create and you can see that it creates the uh, the member. Now, I wasn't very accurate here, and that's why you've got some bowing. Um, so I would typically spend more time cleaning up the position of these joints, these legs, and also the members to make sure they're much more conformal with uh, a smoother output. Okay, so once you've done that, I would then go to uh, Symmetry, and I would click on Create. And I would then pick the Symmetry plane, and I'm just gonna keep everything by default. You have an option to select whether you want the joints to be reflected or the joints and the members. So I'm just going to say all skeleton entities, so basically my joints and members. And I'm going to click on uh, go. And then it's now created clones of the um, uh, the parent uh, joints and uh, members here. And you can see that these are now being created in the browser too. So we have the original joint, which was this one over here. We have the second one here. And we have also the symmetry which are here and here. And you can see all of the relationships are documented, all that's preserved. You save the .hm file and all of this information is, is saved within the .hm. And then we also have the member and the symmetry member as well. So we've got the full composition of exactly how this, this model is being built. And it knows exactly what parts it's been intersected uh, with the sections and everything else. All right, so once you've created the symmetry, I will just back out of that context and I will go back to member. So I need to basically create an enclosed loop such that I can then go and create my ma uh, my panel. Now I'm going to pick on the start joint here. I'm going to pick on the symmetry plane. Instead of picking on this joint, I want this to be symmetric. So I'm going to pick the plane here. And you can see that it's actually created a preview for all of those sections where it's intersecting up until the halfway point, the symmetry plane. I'm going to click on go, and you can now see that that's created the uh, the sections there. Again, I've done this very crudely, and I didn't pay attention really to, to this leg alignment plus the cutout, and that's why these sections here and here are not exactly as I would uh, want them ideally. But let's just move on to the, the next um, member creation, and I'm just going to accept that and click on create. So at this point, I have a completely enclosed loop. Um, this model is in symmetry, and the last thing I need to do now is go to uh, member panels, and I'm just going to pick my members, and I'm going to click on go. Now, before I do that, though, there is um, one option. So this is kind of the uh, the basic mode, where for things like windshields, panel, roof panels, uh, floors, anything that's relatively planar, um, you could use this automatic uh, this this default mode to create some basic basic profiles. Now, if you had a body side or something else that was much more complicated, that obviously can't be auto-generated, you can use an existing uh, part uh, and connect that to the, the, the skeleton model. And I'll show you that uh, in, a, in a video, uh, in the next, uh, next, bit, ne next, uh, next demo. Okay, so once I've done that, I'll click on Create. And you can see now that the member panel is currently being created. And once that's created, I want to show you how this is connected. Now, clearly, I would have spent more time making sure these legs are aligned and things like that properly. Now, if I go to the Move tool here, and I click on this one part, I can drag that up. And you can see that is fully connected to the skeleton underneath. So we also have 
Other contexts as well for connections, whereby I can connect panel to member, member to member, and then panel to member, uh, sorry, panel to panel as well. So in this next portion of the demo, I just wanted to show you how you could actually leverage or, or use an existing, um, more complicated part like this body side, uh, rather than just creating the auto, um, the automatic way of creating these planar parts like the windshield or the roof or anything else like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to turn off and hide the, uh, the body side, and I'm going to connect this body side to the existing skeleton structure that I've created earlier on. So here's just a, a, an example here. We've got, I don't know, eight joints and uh, several, several members. So I'm going to connect that body side to this pre-existing skeleton structure I created. And to do that, if you go to uh, Member Panels, I can click and select all of my uh, members. By default, it would be set to off, but I want to use existing. And I'm going to select my component, and that component is this body side here. Now once I've done that, and I click on create, this is going through now, and it's actually creating the panel relationship and then connecting that to the existing skeleton that you can see on the screen right now. And then once that's completed, it's done, so I'm going to back out now, and I'm going to click on all, and I'm just going to delete or hide the uh, the body side there. So now that's connected. Okay, so under skeleton and panels, all that relationship is now documented and created. Now, if I go and click on the body side itself, just to make sure that the connectivity has done everything that I thought it should do, you can now see that, that is fully connected to the underlying skeleton that I created on that uh, Oh, on, on the other side of the vehicle earlier on. Let me just jump to the topology. Okay, so you can see we've got a pretty organic uh, structure here, and I'm just going to run through how I would probably tackle some of this. So some of this, obviously, there's an awful lot of interpretation that needs to happen here, but just getting that starting point up and running, I think is important. So here, I would probably go through and I, if it were me doing this, probably I would disable the mesh. I could even disable the joint box as well and just create a um, uh, a joint on the outside here, but I'll leave the joint box created for now. I'd probably also increase this to make sure I get something more represent, whoop, not 4,000, more representative. It's probably fine. And if I just click here now, so you can see that this is going to extrapolate based off all of this structure. Now I can spend a lot more time kind of moving this face and making sure that I kind of grab this, but it does get complicated. So it's like, how many legs do we need? Because we've got a, an intersection here, and we've got an intersection here. Typically, you're going to want to model that as one, one leg. So we need to make sure we had all the tools available such that you can go through and add remove legs where you needed to. So if I just go through now and click on apply, so this has actually created the leg, four legs, four legs as I'd wished. However, if I wanted to model this here, I would need to add additional legs. But for now, that's fine. If I go to joint legs, I can now click on this. And if I click on here, I can click and I can now move this such that I can reorientate this uh, this leg more appropriately. And I can spend time moving these legs down and up and all this other good stuff. but. Uh, and then also, if I wanted to add a leg, I could. But also, if I click on this leg, I could then delete it. But I want that leg to be there. So that's just all the movement for the legs. And again, I'm not creating mesh here or assigning any properties or anything. I'll do that as a, a post step. It's much much easier and cleaner just to do this in in uh, in two phases. So if I just run through here, oh, go to uh, create again. Again, I don't really care. The level of detail. So here is a good example of where it's created an additional leg where I didn't necessarily want it. So here I'm going to just go and click the joint and I'm going to click that leg and I'm going to click delete. I'm then going to click that leg and I'm going to scoot this one down a bit. OK, so I can spend all day or a lot of time kind of getting the placement correct or as accurately as I need to, but I think that's fine. All right, um, what I would do now is I would then go to member and I don't need 
my cut planes. I mean, you could, and it will do the interpretation or interpolation through the section cuts. But for this, I'm going to bypass that, and I'm going to say don't realize member either. So literally, I just want to go from A to B. Oops, uh, bear with me. From A to B, and then click on create. And so now you see I've just got a linear uh, member. Clearly, I need to spend more time getting the alignment clean with the joints first, um, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to get, get a chance to do. So from that, again, I'll then go to symmetry. I'll create new. But then map that directly across. And then here, rather than using the symmetry and the section cuts, I'll just go from A to B and just create straight members like that. So you can see that very quickly, I can start building out these different interpretations and then if I had a library of all my sections, I could then apply that library. Or well, firstly, I'd 1D mesh it. Then I would apply the sections to um, to this. So for all this cross bracing and everything else, you can absolutely do that interpretation. So very, very quickly, I think you can get down to a, uh, a simplified 1D, 2D model based off this topology um, topology result. OK, so that's the skeleton modeling. Let me move on to the geometry interpretation. OK. So we added a, uh, a section library um, a couple of releases back. It, um, and like I was saying before, you could actually go through and override this completely uh, with your own sections. So any OEM or any customer can upload uh, their own sections to this uh, this hierarchy. So this section library has the 1D mesh representation, the line representation, and a uh, quad representation, which is seen here with all the beam sections and everything applied to it. So there's a lot of information per section. Uh, it's all been auto welded as well. So these are actually enclosed sections, which is what you need. And I've just taken that as an input for this next demo. So based off, um, depending on what you're doing, optimization or um, any interpretation, you'll have the need to basically go from simplified back to detailed again. And creating lofted surfaces is, is one of those kind of key uh, model reconstruction uh, enablers. And so I'm going to show you a quick demo here, or a quick video, and then I'll show you a quick demo. So this was probably sped up at a factor of, let's say, two to three times. But very quickly, you can, using the auto tangency, you can create these joints and then the members very, very quickly. So using the guides with the rule services, you can create these surfaces. Obviously, you then put the mesh on, you can then connect it and then reconstruct the, uh, the detailed model. So this capability is currently available already today, but under the theme of concept and optimization, I wanted to just uh, just highlight this again. So very quickly, I mean, this probably took in real time maybe five minutes to get to that point there. So very quickly, you can do any interpretation and uh, get to that point. All right, so we're just going to look at the geometry reconstruction. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just wanted to show um, show you how quickly and easy it is to actually generate the uh, the surface data. OK, all right, so th there are some elements in here right now. I'm just going to go through and delete all those for now, so I don't need them. But if we just focus on the uh, the joint area around here and then this, uh, this member. Under geometry here, you could go through and actually link all these lines together. That's probably a good first step. So by combining each of these different segments to really create one line per part. Would probably be something that you can do and creating or picking by the line list is very, very easy now. Um, but the next thing I wanted to show you is just the basic line creation. So I'm just going to create from the end here. So I don't need to zoom in a lot now in uh, in Hyperworks to pick the end. The end of that profile, I can just click. And it gives me the the cue that I'm in the the correct pick zone, and then by clicking on that third icon in the um, the dialog there, I can now just simply drag, and I can get the order tangency to pretty much where I need, and then I can create that line. So if I do the same for this uh, this location here and here, so I'm not going to go through all of this. In a lot more detail, but I just want to just give you that that cue, that feedback as to how 
you would actually go about doing that today. So it's very, very quick. And then from that, you'd then just go to rules and you would literally just pick. Pick line A and line B. Oh, come on. There you go. And then just click on create. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go through and spend the time reconstructing this whole uh, this whole joint, but it's very, very easy now to, to go through and then create the members as well directly from that. And then you can organize those into different parts and things like that. Obviously, remesh, apply the connectors um, and then build out your, your detailed representation. Also, if you wanted to swap out a portion of a model uh, with a new section, you could then reconstruct the geometry and then kind of splice that back into a model as well if um, if you needed to. So there's a lot of capabilities here now for, for doing these kind of uh, design changes. OK, the last thing I wanted to talk about today was the uh, poly cage and poly nerve support. So we've always been able to, uh, well, for the last couple of releases, we've always been able to read in the poly nerve data from Inspire uh, within the STMOD file. But now in version 2022, we can also read the poly cage data and the reason why we have done that is that this will be a major enabler for automating some of the, the model build uh, processes. So with that cage data, obviously you get the benefit of doing topology interpretation within Inspire. You can read in that polynerb data back into Hypermesh. But the cage data, we are actually able to do advanced selection with it as well. So anything that falls within the cage, you'll be able to select. So lines, points, nodes, elements, solids, whatever it might be, all of that is supported. So if, for example, you had to do an interpretation of a vehicle or, or any model for that matter, if you spent the time creating the cages and inspire first, you could then leverage that and automate some of the processes further downstream. So let me just jump to a demo right now. And if I go to poly cages, now on import, I'm, I'm importing an ST mod file right now. Under entities, we now have this poly cage. Okay. And this comes in as a new hypermesh entity. So there's a browser. But obviously these entities are only listed if you have a poly cage in uh, in the model. So once this is read in, you'll actually see the poly nerve data and the cage data. All right, let's just get the uh, the view orientations fixed for this. OK. So I've completely and utterly over uh, interpreted this with the polynerves, which is the blue blue part here. OK, so you can turn that on and off exactly as you would do. So that's great for doing any topology interpretation. Um, so I'm going to leave that turned off. Now under poly cages, which are also listed in the main browser here, I can go through and we have access to all of the attribute data yeah, so I'm just going to change that color. So if you can imagine, if I had actually organized and created cages right the way around this vehicle, I could start to build out uh, templates for, for, for some of the model build uh, activities. Now, what's important here is that, OK, poly cage is fine. I can pick them, select them, great. But really, the, the, the best benefit here is if I go to elements, for example, and I click on advanced selection. Here now, I've got by poly cage, and I can pick by poly cage, and you can see that all of my elements that fall within those poly cages are now selected. So if, for example, you wanted to automate the skeletal model build using cages, you are now able to do that directly. You can see that I wasn't very uh, accurate with my picking, but uh, if you need all of the element to be within the cage itself, so you can see I've missed some of the flanges down here. So any advanced selection, you are now able to, to leverage these poly cages. So that was elements. If I go to nodes, for example, uh, click on here, and then by poly cage, make the selection. All of this is extremely quick and obviously in real time. So again, all uh, FE data, um, lines, surfaces, solids, all of that is fully supported. So I think this is a, a good catalyst for a lot of model automation further downstream. OK. So in summary. You can see now that for version 2022, uh, we've added an awful lot of uh, content to be able to take a detailed model. Reduce that model to something more simplified. Um, leveraging the skeleton modeling capabilities and leveraging the uh, reconstruction. We've been able to 
basically uh, go from simplified back to, to detailed. So really we're kind of enclosing and encompassing that whole uh, whole optimization and model build interpretation loop um, in, in version 2022. Okay, so that uh, that summarizes everything I wanted to talk about today. So thank you.